um, we are here at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. My name is Angie. I'm part of the education team here, and I have a couple other of my uh, team members with you. You may hear their voices in the background. I've got Dylan here on the computer and Sidra running the camera. So welcome from MOR. Um, a couple things before we get started and I introduce our speaker. You are probably familiar with the Zoom platform at this point, but just in case you're not, we've got two features that you're going to use today. The first one is the chat box. You may have been using that chat box already to tell us who you are, where you're from, what school you go to, what grade you're in. Anything you type into that chat box, we'll see, we'll respond and we'll uh, uh, fill in uh, Scott here on any answers to questions you may have. So the second feature that, uh, that we have is the question and answer area. If you've got a question for Scott, just type it into that Q&A area. If you use the chat box, we may not see it, but if you use the Q&A area, we'll keep track of those questions and get your answers uh, as we can throughout the program. So again, welcome. Welcome to Museum of the Rockies. Today we are talking about fossils, and I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Scott Williams. Scott is the, oh my gosh. I'm the paleontology lab and field specialist here at MOR. Fantastic. We're so happy you're here. Thanks for joining us, and we'll send it over to Scott. Thanks for being here, Scott. Thanks, Angie. Hi, hey everyone. Hope everyone's doing all right. Uh, we're going to talk about a variety of fossils. We're going to talk about what is a fossil, uh, the types of fossils, and how fossils are made. Remember to throw questions in, in the chat uh, as we go along. Part of this is going to be PowerPoint, and then we're going to switch back and forth between the slideshow presentation and the stuff I have here on the table, so you'll have to bear with us. Um, next slide, please. All right, for those of you who may not be familiar where we're at, we're in southwestern Montana. So uh, here is a map of the United States. You can see uh, the red dot denoting where Museum of the Rockies is. Next slide. We'll zoom in on Montana, and we'll see it a little bit closer where we're at. Again, we're just about not quite an hour, hour and a half north of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, as we'll go through this, you'll find out that Montana is a really cool place to find fossils with lots of fossils here, lots of really good geology. Next slide. Out front is our, uh, our really cool mascot, uh, Big Mike. Uh, does anyone have any idea on what kind of dinosaur this is? If you you know what kind of dinosaur this is, uh, send it in the chat box and tell us, uh, tell us what you think it is. Got some answers coming in here, Scott. We have quite a few folks saying T-Rex, T-Rex, T-Rex. T-Rex, that's correct. Next slide. It is a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and here's our friend from Jurassic Park, T-Rex, giving you a big roar. Good job. Uh, hopefully some of you have made it to Museum of the Rockies. If you haven't, uh, when it's safe to do so, come visit us and you'll see Big Mike for yourself. Next slide. All right, when you come to the museum, this is our Siebel Dinosaur Complex. Uh, you'll see a variety of uh, really cool mounted dinosaurs, real fossils. Um, that's one of the things we pride ourselves on here at Museum of the Rockies, just showing you real material, real fossils. Next slide. Question is, what is a fossil? We get that question a lot. Uh, and so we're going to go through the basic definitions of fossils here. Fossils are preserved remains and traces and evidences of organisms past life. Generally, these things are about 12,000 years old or older. This is a number that we've assigned. So basically from the ice age, when we have mammoths and mastodons, to Tyrannosaurus rexes, to even further in time where we have uh, trilobites and graptolites and weird invertebrate creatures. They can be preserved as hard parts, bones, teeth, claws, shells. Uh, we can get impressions, tracks and trackways, burrows, and even soft tissue like skin and feathers and things like that, which is really cool. The takeaway is fossils are not always turned to stone, and that's something we're going to cover here in just a little bit. Next slide. There are two main types of fossils body fossils, which are your hard parts. So if you're looking at me right now, my skeleton, so my skull, my arm bones, my leg bones, my rib cage, those are all considered parts of my body. And when 
Let's say I were to keel over right now and get buried in 20 million years from now, somebody finds me, those hard parts that get preserved are body fossils. So bones, teeth, claws, and shells. We also get uh, what we call trace fossils. Trace fossils is evidence that an organism was there and it did something. So it might uh, walk along a muddy shore and leave footprints that we find millions of years later. It could burrow through the bottom of the sea floor. It could be an insect that chews away on a leaf and we find the leaf fossil and the uh, holes, the little chew marks are still there. And it can be coprolite, fossil poop. Yup, I said poop. And we're gonna show you something in just a sec. So if we can flip back over to live, I will show you some examples of all of the above. I'm gonna pull this up. Then we have a guess on what this is. This is a real fossil. So if you have a guess, use that chat box. So switch back over to that chat box if you're in the Q&A and type on into the chat what two. that may be. Uh, I guess it's tooth, horn. Okay, whoever said horn, you're correct. This is a Claw. horn to a juvenile triceratops. So the three-horned dinosaur, this is a this is a kid triceratops. But it's an example of a body fossil. So this is part of the hard part of the skull, the horn that comes over the eye. I have another example here that I'm going to show you. Again, this is a body fossil. What are we looking at here? Any guesses on what this is? Fang, claw, tooth. All good guesses, but... Raptor claw, beak. It is a claw. It's not to a raptor. Um, it's to a dinosaur called an Allosaurus. This is actually a hand claw to our famous Allosaurus, Big Al. So, again, this is a body fossil, one of the hard parts. Now, I'm going to show you this. All right, see all these little weird marks on this slab? I'll turn it around a little bit. This is an example of a trace fossil. So these aren't the hard parts of an animal, but it's something that it left behind. Any guesses on what these are? Uh, footprints, skin. Footprints, that's correct. So whoever guessed footprints, you're right on the money. These are uh, 75 million year old crab footprints. So 75 million years ago up in Northwest Montana, uh, near a river or lake, little crabs were walking along, leaving these cool little footprints got covered with sediment and the sediment hardened up, what we call lithified. And here we have a series of trackways. So that's kind of cool. Now, more trace fossils. These are coprolites. So does anyone remember what I said coprolites were? That's right, this is fossilized poop. This stuff is about 30 million years old. Um, and it comes from uh, the badlands of uh, of Montana. So sometimes we can even tell what kind of poop this belongs to because there might be little chunks of bone in here, which tells us it's a meat eater, which is kind of cool. All right. So remember, body fossils and trace fossils. Okay, we're going to go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, next slide. All right, now we're going to talk about the types of fossilization. Remember I said not all fossils are turned to stone. There's five main types of fossils or fossilization processes. Replacement, permineralization, I know these are big words, but we'll go over all of them. Mold and cast, carbonization, and then unaltered or original remains. Next slide. 
So a replacement. This is when uh, uh, when minerals are transported by groundwater and invade all the space within an organism. So the, what we have right here is a piece of petrified wood that you see, and I'll show it to you close up here in a second. Now, wood is made of um, cellulose and other material that decomposes, basically deteriorates fairly quickly. So what happens is other minerals, like uh, minerals that uh, are hard, like quartz or silica or mica, uh, invade those spaces as this thing is decomposing and replaces it completely. So the original cellulose is replaced with hard parts. This is an example of a quote unquote turn to stone fossil. Um, and we can actually get that sometimes in bones as well, not just plant material. If you switch over to live, I will show you this particular uh, fossil. You can see it has the shape of a big chunk of wood, right? You can actually see what looks like kind of grains of the wood here, but it is solid through and through. It's a silica quartz replacement. So this is very heavy. And the only thing it really preserves is the shape of this chunk of wood. Okay, that is replacement. All right, back to live or back to PowerPoint, sorry. Next slide. Permineralization. Okay, this is an example of when you have the original organism, in this case, we have two pictures here. One is a duckbill vertebra. The other one is a fossil called a trilobite. It's an invertebrate fossil. Well, these animals, when they were alive, have open spaces in their hard parts. We call these spaces pores. And over time, minerals, again, can add to those spaces, basically fill in those blank spaces and slightly alter them. So dinosaur bones, shells are good examples of what we call permineralization. And I have a whole bunch of these little fellas right here. These are little fossils called brachiopods. And we'll see if we can get this nice up and close here. There we go. These are kind of look like clams. They got two halves, but the shell has been added to it, has a, has a mineral in there called calcium carbonate. If I were to take a little bit of vinegar and drop on this, it would start fizzing because the calcium carbonate will break down. Uh, vinegar is a mild acid. But you can see I've got a whole bunch of them here. These were very common fossils that lived in the oceans around Montana about 400 million years ago. All right, back to slide. Okay, next. All right, this is called mold and cast. I'm originally from uh, the state of Illinois, which is in the Midwest. And in the state of Illinois, we have lots of limestone fossils. And that represents a seaway, which was over Illinois about 450 million years ago. So I think there might be some folks from Chicago. This applies to you. Um, Chicago was under a marine or an ocean setting, tropical setting, about 450 million years ago as well. So think about it this way. I'm a little, I'm a little snail swimming along. I die and I fall to the bottom of the sea floor. When I land in that soft sediment, I make an impression. Then more sediment comes down and buries me. Over time, my hard parts and my soft parts decompose or disappear. But the impression that I make is still there. That impression we call a mold. And then if more sediment gets in and fills in that impression, it's a cast. So what you see here are a series of snails and cephalopods, which are 
related to squid and octopus, that died, came to rest on a seafloor, and got buried. Their shells are gone, their soft parts are gone, but the impressions and the fill-in, the cast, are, are still there. So these are some of the fossils that you would find around Illinois and Wisconsin. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, carbonization. This one's kind of a cool one because this is you, uh, an example of where you can get some really delicate fossils that are preserved. So this is where um, one of the elements that make us all living things is called carbon, right? When we, when we decompose and we die, all of our soft parts and some of our hard parts will disappear, uh, decompose. But sometimes what's left over is the carbon. It's maybe the last thing to go, so to speak. So what happens is, Let's say I'm a leaf and I fall to the, I fall to uh, a in, into a mucky swamp where there's not a lot of oxygen, there's not a lot of critters in there to eat me up or anything like that, and then more sediment buries me, and with heat and pressure and time, what is left and what gets preserved as an impression is the carbon that's in in my body if I'm the little leaf. We can also get it with insects. So here we have an example of two examples of carbonization. Those leaves that you see are also from Illinois. They're from what's known as the Maison Creek Formation, um, and they are about 300 million years old. Uh, the insect below <clears throat> is a bit younger. It is a damselfly from southwestern Wyoming, and it is about 50 million years old. Now, what you see is the carbon impression of that insect. And I have a little insect here. We're going to see if you guys can see it. This one was collected here in Montana. It is also about, uh, I think, 30 million years old or so. So we're going to try this here. All right. So. You might be able to see its wings, and its body, and its head. This is a type of fly. This is a 30 million year old fly. But it is preserved via carbonization. And I've got another example. Here's one of those leaves from Illinois, from the Maison Creek. Again, you can see all of its structure. All of these leaf fronds are here. There we go. This is a 300 million year old fern. Okay. Right, we'll go back to uh, slides. Next slide. All right. The last is unaltered or original remains. Um, these are very rare, very rare indeed. Um, and so this is where the organism has not been changed chemically. It has not been added to. It hasn't been replaced. Um, it is basically the way it was when it died. And here we have two examples. Up in the right-hand corner is a little baby mammoth. This is a little baby mammoth named Yuba. It was found several years ago. Um, it was less than two months old when it died. But it's all there. It's hair, it's skin, it's eyelashes, even its internal organs are there and preserved. It was basically buried in an environment that had little or no oxygen, no bacteria to eat it or break it down, and then frozen. The uh, Organ the fossil below it is a little lizard trapped in amber. That's a 90 million year old lizard, and it's all there trapped in amber. It basically was encased and preserved so it couldn't really decompose or nothing could get to it, eat it, take parts of it off or anything like that. So those are examples of unaltered or original material. Next slide. 
So the question now is, we've talked about, we've talked about uh, what a fossil is, the types of fossils, and how they're how they're preserved. So finding fossils is just like it is in Jurassic Park, right? We just go out, brush off some sand, and there they are, right? Nope. I wish it was that easy. We'd have a lot more fossils. But uh, next slide. Finding fossils takes a lot of components, a lot of different moving parts working together. First, we have to understand the geologic time scale, the age of the Earth, where we find certain fossils. Certain fossils are only known from certain time periods and certain geologic formations. So we also have to understand the geology, how rocks are formed. For example, um, if we went to Hawaii, looking for Tyrannosaurus rex, we would be out of luck because the majority of the rocks there are volcanic. We're not gonna find a dinosaur there. However, if we go to Eastern Montana, where there's the right formation, the right kind of rocks, we can find T-Rex and Triceratops and Edmontosaurus. So we also have to find areas that have rocks that are exposed. Next slide. So this is going to be a little overwhelming, but that is the geologic time scale. That is the time scale that uh, basically divides and breaks apart about 4.5, 4.6 billion years. And as I said, there are certain fossils and certain dinosaurs that are only known from certain uh, time periods. Next slide. So for example, a lot of dinosaurs did not live at the same time. Tyrannosaurus rex lived between 66 and 67 million years ago. Diplodocus and its cousin Apatosaurus and Brachiosaurus lived about 147 to 150 million years ago. They never ever would have met each other, ever. So there were different types of dinosaurs living together with T-Rex and with Diplodocus, but they're from different time periods. Next slide. You have to understand that what rocks do. For example, if you look to the right hand corner there, you'll see what's uh, called the law of superposition. The oldest rocks are on the bottom. The youngest rocks are on the top. So when a river floods and it deposits sediments, then it does it again next year, the year after, those sediments get deposited on top of older sediments. If over time we have mountain building or uplift and all of a sudden that flat horizontal surface becomes something like this, we have to remember that that stuff was originally deposited on a flat horizontal surface. And then if we have erosion and weathering, basically gaps in our outcrops and fossil records, we know that there was something in between. So you can see what that uh, bottom right hand corner, there looks like a, there's a little valley there. So you can see it's numbered one, two, three, four. Well, four used to go all the way across, but got eroded or weathered away. Next slide. We take all of that stuff and we make geologic maps. So each formation, each rock formation gets an age, uh, gets a name, and then gets put on a map. So if we want to find, like I said, Triceratops or Tyrannosaurus rex, we're going to look in the southeastern part or eastern part of Montana. Next slide. So let's say we're going to look for Triceratops. That's one of the most common dinosaurs we can find. 66 to 67 million years old. As I said, found in eastern Montana. Next slide. If you come to the Museum of the Rockies, this is our Hall of Horns and Teeth. These are all late Cretaceous fossils from the Hell Creek Formation. And you can see Triceratops. We've got a lot of Triceratops from little babies all the way up to adults. Next slide. This is what a reconstruction of eastern Montana would look like around 66 to 67 million years ago. Very warm, wet, subtropical, very different than what it is today. Next slide. 
If we were to get in a spacecraft and fly around the Earth, take a look at North America, this is what it would look like. We can tell again from the rocks that we have observed and collected throughout North America that at that time there was an uh, inland sea which had bisected the United States and Canada, and eastern Montana would have been near the coastline. So when you think of eastern Montana, think of Florida and Louisiana, Alabama, the Gulf Coast states, warm and subtropical. Next slide. This is what it looks like today, very different. These are outcrops that are uh, known as the Hell Creek Formation, a very famous fossil location where you can find lots of cool dinosaurs, including Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, and Montosaurus, even some of the raptor dinosaurs. Next slide. What we do to find fossils in this is we simply walk around looking for bones that are weathering out. That yellow arrow points to a student. That's a college student from Montana State University. So that also gives you an idea how big these outcrops are. Um, and because I'm old, I get to sit down on the bottom and take pictures of students climbing around looking for fossils. When you get old, you can do the same thing. <laughs> Next slide. All right. When you first find fossils, dinosaur fossils, they don't look very pretty because they have eroded away. They've been rained on, they've been frozen, they've thawed, they've been rained on again. And remember I said these bones have pore space, open space. So they can absorb that moisture, that rain, and that'll cause them to expand and contract and expand and contract and break apart. Well, those arrows point to bones that um, I came across a couple years ago. The big kind of flat white thing is a leg bone or triceratops. And in the back is part of the frill or the head shield to a triceratops. It's just starting to come up. Next slide. This is the part they don't show you in Jurassic Park. So we don't just brush it off with a little brush and it's all there. We have to take picks and shovels and sometimes jackhammers and remove sometimes tons of material to get down to the bone layer. And that's what we're doing here. Um, we put a protective layer of tarps over the bone layer so when that, those rocks come down, they don't hurt any of the bones. Next slide. But once we get that material removed, that overburden, we can start using small picks, hand picks and tools to remove the rock around it. And what you see here is a whole jumble of Triceratops bones. To the left, there's a bunch of ribs. Uh, right, this is Dr. Yoshi Katsura from Japan. He's a colleague of ours that comes over and he found this beautifully large, well-preserved Triceratops horn. So this is one of the orbital horns. And right next to it is part of the head shield. Um, this is a site that we nicknamed Captain Chuck. And we end up finding a lot of material. We have hip bones and leg bones and ribs and vertebra and part of the skull. And there's more there. Next slide. We then map all of the bones in relationship to each other. So this is kind of like crime scene, CSI type stuff. We need to be able to create a map showing everything in relation to, to each other uh, and even in three dimensions sometimes. So here we have a couple of our college students uh, mapping uh, the bones uh, in place. And also, are they dipping? Are they at an angle? Things like that. Next slide. Once we're ready to remove the bone, we have it mapped, we have it photographed, we then will plaster it. This process is basically the same kind of process to remove an dinosaur bone that's been used for about 130 years. So we'll cover it in some sort of separator like uh, wet paper towels or tin foil. And then we take burlap strips that we dip in plaster of Paris, we wrap the whole bone till it hardens up then we roll the whole thing and do the same thing to the other side. Next slide. And then we have to carry it out. And sometimes you have to carry it out a long distance. 
In the upper left-hand corner, that team is carrying out a T-Rex femur at about a mile. So it took us uh, about half a day to get it out. Uh, the team on the bottom there, that is uh, uh, Captain Chuck. They're taking out uh, a femur or a leg bone for Captain Chuck. Fortunately, um, the Captain Chuck site was uh, only a quarter mile from where we parked our vehicle, so we didn't have to go too far. But sometimes it's so far away and so remote, you even have to get helicopters out there to collect the material. So that gives you an idea of how you find a fossil, what you do when you get it, and a lot of the work that goes into getting them out. Uh, so hopefully I've shown that it's not as easy as it's shown in the movies, but it's still fun and you can still find some really cool things. So next slide. That's my PowerPoint uh, covering everything that we just talked about. Certainly the extremal learning. And uh, do we have time for questions? Yeah, we sure do. We've got about five minutes, so um, let's let's answer some questions. Sure. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what is the oldest dinosaur we found? The oldest dinosaur that we have found here in Mon uh, in Montana or ever? Well, let's go with Montana. Okay. So in Montana, the oldest fossils that we have are from the. Uh, uh, Jurassic aged uh, Morrison formation and I have a map of Montana here and if we basically go down in this area right here are is rocks that date to about 150 million years old and those are where we find the big long neck dinosaurs the sauropods we also have a stegosaur from this area so those are the oldest dinosaurs that we have in Montana the oldest known dinosaur uh, dates to about 230 million years old and is found, was actually found in South America, uh, in, known from the Triassic period. Okay. Um, what uh, killed the dinosaurs? And if they're still around, would they be dangerous to humans? Okay. Um, the leading theory, uh, based on a lot of evidence, is that uh, 66 million years ago, an asteroid the size of Manhattan, so that's a part of New York City, uh, it would have been about uh, seven, eight miles wide, slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula down by the Gulf of Mexico at about 30,000 miles per hour. It would have been a catastrophic explosion. Um, it would have sent shockwaves out everywhere. It would have ejected hundreds and trillions of tons of uh, of debris in the air, uh, eventually covering the planet so that no, no sun would get in. Um, that killed about 70% of everything, not just dinosaurs, but the swimming marine reptiles, the pterosaurs, um, the ammonites, the, co the coiled uh, octopus squid looking creatures. Um, Everything got hit, even fossil, even ancient mammals got nailed, about 30% extinction for them. Um, so it was a really, really bad day uh, 66 million years ago. And the question, uh, uh, would they be dangerous to humans? That's a good question. If dinosaurs didn't go extinct, I'm not convinced that we'd be here because dinosaurs were the dominant land animal for like 160 million years. They were the rulers of the roost. Mammals, which we are a mammal, didn't get much bigger than this. So basically possum sized. So when dinosaurs went extinct, that opened the door for mammals to spread out, diversify, eventually get bigger, things like that. So it's sad that the dinosaurs went extinct, but at the same time, had they not, we might not be here. So one more question and then we'll wrap up. Okay, let's see. What is the biggest dinosaur you've ever found? And what's the biggest dinosaur ever found? Okay, the biggest dinosaur I have ever found is an Apatosaurus. So that's one of the uh, uh, big long neck dinosaurs. I found it down in southern Utah. Um, it wasn't fully grown. Its, its leg bone was only about this tall off the ground. Uh, a really big Apatosaurus could have a, a femur about this big. So we can estimate that this 
Apatosaurus was probably about 60, maybe 70 feet long based on the size of its femur. Uh, the largest dinosaur known, it's a tie between two big long neck dinosaurs. One is called Argentinosaurus and the other one is called Patagotitan. They're both found from South America down in Patagonia. Both would have been about 120 to 130 feet long, about 50 feet tall, and weighing close to 100 tons. Great. Awesome. Uh, if we could put up the last slide, we've got an email address for you today. So we're so glad you joined us here at Museum of the Rockies. A big thank you to Streamable Learning, um, as always, for um, putting this together and being such a great host for us. We had so many great questions come in and we didn't get to all of them. So if we missed your question, send us an email at moroutreach at montana.edu. Um, we'd be happy to get it answered for you. We've got a lot, uh, many more programs coming up this fall and into the winter. So uh, check us out online and we hope to see you again soon. On behalf of Streamable Learning Museum of the Rockies, thank you everybody, have a great day.